Jerry Brudos, Shoe Fetish Slayer Jerry Brudos became obsessed with women's shoes when he was five. In 1944, he was playing outside his home in Oregon when he noticed a pair of stilettos in a junkyard. He was so fascinated by those beautiful shoes that he brought them home and started playing with them. Brudos' mother was a strict mom. As soon as she saw him playing with a pair of shoes, she began to yell at him and told him that he had better take them back to the dump. Brudos tried hiding the shoes from her, but she found and burned them. After that, he never looked at women's shoes the same way again. Despite his mother's obvious disapproval, he began to steal shoes so he could create his collection secretly. Brudos was also obsessed with women undergarments and would steal them from female neighbors. He spent his teen years in and out of psychotherapy and psychiatric hospitals. With every year passing, his obsession began to grow. Whenever he would see a woman wearing shoes, he would follow them, strangle them, and steal the shoes. By the late 1960s, Brudos attempted a horrific act that was beyond imagination. He didn't just want to steal the shoes now, but he would ask women to follow his sexual demands. In 1961, he married a 17-year-old girl, Darcy, with whom he would father two children. He asked his new bride to do housework naked except for a pair of high heels while taking pictures. At about this time, he began complaining of migraine headaches and blackouts, relieving his symptoms with night prowling raids to steel shoes and lace undergarments. Brudos would experience a transvestite period, where he used the female persona as a form of escape mechanism. After a few years of marriage, Darcy and Jerry Brudos' relationship became strained. Darcy began to focus more on their two children, and she started to refuse her husband's more unusual demands. Brudos, feeling rejected, began to stalk the neighbors' houses for women's shoes and undergarments, looking for an outlet for his obsession. In 1969, he told his wife not to enter the garage without his permission. Though he loved heels and ladies' garments, he wanted models to wear them and act for him. One day, a door-to-door -door encyclopedia saleswoman, Linda Slauson, 19, knocked on Brudo's door. He lured her to the basement and tried to convince her to take her clothes off and pose for her. But when she didn't listen, he knocked her out with a wooden plank and strangled her. He dressed her in different female undergarments and shoes he had stolen, arranged her body in provocative poses, and used a hacksaw to cut off her left foot, which he kept in a freezer and used to model his collection of high heel shoes. He disposed of the body in the Willamette River. The first murder attempt gave him confidence and a desire for more. Jan Susan Whitney, 23, was a motorist whose car broke down on November 26, 1968. Brudos offered to drive her to his home with the excuse of letting her call a tow truck there. While still in the car, he strangled her with a leather strap and raped her. He kept the body hanging from the pulley in his garage for several days, during which he dressed, photographed, and had sex with it. This time, Brudos cut off one of her breasts and made a resin mold of it that he used as a paperweight. Afterward, he tied the body to a piece of railroad iron and threw it in the Willamette along with Slauson's foot, which had rotted. On March 27, 1969, he abducted Karen Sprinker, 18, from a parking lot outside a department store. Brudos was dressed in women's clothes during this attack. He took her to his garage, made her try on his collection of undergarments and pose while he photographed her, raped her, and strangled her by hanging her by her neck from a pulley. Bruto sexually abused her body on several occasions and cut off her breasts to make plastic molds. Afterward, he tied the body to a six-cylinder car engine with a nylon cord and threw it in the Willamette. The murder spree continued. He would kidnap women wearing heels, kill them, and keep their bodies until it rots. Most murders occurred in his garage, but his wife and kids never came to know about it. A few weeks after Jerry Brudos murdered Linda Sally, her body was found in the Long Tom River, weighed down by a car part. As the police searched the river, they found another woman weighed down by a car part Karen Sprinkler. Both bodies had been severely mutilated. The police began to investigate the gruesome crimes. After interviewing students at the nearby Oregon State University, they heard stories about a Vietnam vet who had called a few young women looking for a date. One of the women told police that he had mentioned the bodies in the river and had made an unsettling suggestion about how he could strangle her. Somebody called the police 
the police came out and was looking at the accident. Officer himself actually had tried to look in into the garage through a crack in the board. lived in South Salem, uh, probably about two miles away from where Myron Frank's uh, story. He had something to eat and watch the cartoon while she strangled at the end of that. A cast from them, and then he attempts to make some kind of bronze. As it turned out, that man was Jerry Brudos. The police asked one of the girls to set up another date with Brudos. Then they swooped in to interrogate him and quickly decided to investigate further. After police obtained a search warrant for Brudo's home, they found evidence that proved beyond a doubt that he was the murderer. There was nylon rope, photographs of the dead women, and most horrifyingly, the body parts he had kept from his heinous crimes. At some point during an interrogation, Brudo's confessed to all four murders and other attempted kidnappings and earlier assaults. During the investigation, piles of women's shoe catalogs were found in his cell. He wrote to major companies requesting them and claimed they were his substitute for pornography. He lodged countless appeals, including one in which he alleged that a photograph taken of him with one of his victim's corpses could not prove his guilt because it was not the body of a person he was convicted of killing. In 1995, the parole board told Brudos that he would never be released. Jerry Brudos was found guilty of the murders of Sprinkler, Whitney, and Sally and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. He'd escaped conviction for Slauson's murder only because her body was never found. When Brudos' wife learned about her husband's heinous crimes, she couldn't believe that all this happened under the same roof she lived. Killer will kill and uh, have sex with him after death. And so necrophilia is one of his primary motivations. Nobody would ever know because he was doing it within the privacy of his own home. When we talk about paraphilia, as they say, specifically fetishes, that would uh, make him feel better about himself. Yeah, I've, I've gone a lot of places and done a lot of things. I'm assuming that I never hurt anybody because I never got any complaints from anybody. As for Bruto's wife, she divorced him after his arrest. She gave all the details about how her husband had treated her all these years. She was so embarrassed about her husband's acts that she changed her and her children's names and moved away to an undisclosed location. Although Darcy was charged with aiding and abetting her husband in his crimes, she was not convicted of murdering any victims. Jerry Brudos developed liver cancer and got very sick in jail. He served 37 years of his sentence and died in 2006 in prison. That's a wrap for today. Don't forget to smash the thumbs up, share, and subscribe to the channel to see our latest content.